So we're in Acts 16, and you say, hey, Brother Corman, I thought we were going to go through the book of Philippians on Thursdays, but if you're paying attention while the Scripture's being read, you probably notice that Acts 16 is a great deal of it takes place in the city of Philippi. So I thought it'd be good as we're kind of going through the book of Philippians, uh, one, to not be in a rush about it. As I mentioned last week, it's a great book. Might as well take our time and enjoy it. But also I thought it'd be good to maybe just kind of get some background about uh, the city of Philippi and its people, the place and the people of Philippi, before we kind of dig into the book. And I think there's some application we can, we can make as we go and some things we can learn just by kind of looking at the characters and the place of, uh, of those that were in the, are in the book of Philippians. And, of course, here in Acts chapter 16. And, of course, uh, we mentioned last week in Philippians chapter 1, you want to keep something in Acts 16 all night. You might want to go over to Philippians chapter 1. Keep, you know, if you can keep something in both places, we'll go back and forth a little bit, but we're going to be primarily in Acts chapter 16. It says there in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servant of Jesus Christ, all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. So, uh, you know, Paul is the, the, the author or the writer, I guess you would say, <laughs> you would say of, uh, of Philippians. And, you know, some people might say, well, it says Paul and Timotheus, you know, so maybe how do we know which one it is? But we have to remember who Timothy was. He was somebody that helped Paul and Silas, and that's found in Acts chapter 16. We see where Timothy joined them uh, and to go on these missionary journeys with Paul. It says in verse 1 of Acts 16, verse 1, Then came he to Derbe, uh, Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed. But his father was a Greek, verse 9, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man in Macedonia, which is where uh, the city of Philippi was, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after that, he, and after he had seen the vision, immediately he, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering the Lord to call us first to preach the gospel unto them. So you see where Paul comes in in Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Timothy joins him there, and then he goes in and ends up in Philippi eventually. And, you know, further proof, you know, and, and I'm sure there's nobody in here that's really struggling tonight, you know, who wrote the book of Philippians. It's a very commonly accepted thing that Paul wrote it. But, you know, sometimes, you know, we just kind of take these things for granted. Sometimes it's good to know why we believe what we believe. Why do we believe Paul is the author of the book of Philippians tonight? Well, first of all, we see uh, that Timothy is referred to in the third person. If you go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, he says, But I trust, in verse 19, if you want to go there, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you. So it wouldn't make any sense for Timothy to say that about himself. And not only that, if you go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, we see where Paul describes himself. He says in verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh, other, thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And he goes on, talks about he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and as touching the law of Pharisee, so on and so forth. So Paul not only refers to Timothy in the third person, but then also goes on to describe himself in the first person. So just getting that out of the way real quick, that's you know some proof right there that Paul is the author you know, he's the writer. We understand that, you know, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, so on and so forth, but he is the one that is uh, dictating this epistle. But let's talk a little bit more tonight about the people to whom that epistle is directed to, and this would be the people of Philippi. You know, uh, the, the Philippian church was made up, obviously, of people that lived there. Now, there were uh, people that came from different regions. We'll see that about Lydia here in a minute, that came and lived in that city. But the city of Philippi was um, uh, one of the chief cities of the Roman Empire back then. And if you want to go to Acts chapter 16, look at verse 20. It says, and he brought them to them, to, to, and excuse me, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. So we see this that there's this Roman civil structure there. It's a chief city, as we'll see in a minute. But because the folks in Philippi were, were Roman citizens, what we understand is that, or we need to understand, and I'll make application here at the end, is that because they were there, they had certain benefits that not everybody did. They benefited from being in that particular city and being Roman citizens. If you go to, uh, well, you further, we'll just move on here. You know, uh, th this is a very key city, okay? 
uh, you know, in verse uh, 12 there, if you want to go there, it says in, uh, in Acts 16, tw uh, verse 12, it says, And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of, a part of Macedonia. So they are benefiting from the fact that they are a chief city. And again, we'll, we'll come back to that towards the end. We're just kind of looking at some things about the city of Philippi tonight. Also, there is this apparent lack of a synagogue, which, you know, may or may not be a good thing, depending on how you take that, right? In verse 13, it says, And on the Sabbath day, this is after they'd come to Philippi, right, from Troas, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. You know, and want there just meaning that was their custom. That was their behavior in this situation, that on the Sabbath day, instead of going into a synagogue, you know, it appears that they would rather go to this, uh, this riverside and to do, make prayer. And, of course, Paul went there and preached. So we would see also that uh, one of the things about the city of Philippi is that this is not a, you know, Jewish safe space, as we would call it today, right? Uh, it says in verse 20, if you recall there, again, when they're bringing Paul to the magistrates, they said to him, these men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Right, and it's it's kind of interesting that they point that out that not only are they troubling our city, but that they're Jews. Right, so this isn't uh, the Jews don't have a synagogue there; they don't have a lot of influence there. In fact, there probably was some hostility. Now you could look at that and say, "What are, the, are these guys anti-Semitic, or is this an accurate description of the Jews?" I'll let you decide that tonight. Right, they're always kind of causing trouble. Right, they're always uh, even today they've they've gotten that reputation of being people that you know, are kind of troublemakers. I mean, they've been kicked out of so many countries and so on and so forth. And even today, you know, they're responsible for a lot of the wickedness that's in our country, so on and so forth. And that's just a fact. That's really a whole nother sermon right there. But that's kind of just a background of the city of Philippi, you know, and we could talk about if you really wanted to dig into the, the historical context of it, you know, it's a chief city. It's on a, a major highway. It's kind of on the edge of the Roman Empire, and because of that, it benefits a lot. of uh, A lot of commerce was there uh, <clears throat> when it was when the Greeks had it. I believe it went by a different name, but there was apparently a lot of gold mines there that were used to help expand their empire. So this is a very wealthy city. Okay, this is a very wealthy city, and I believe that we kind of get it. We can kind of see that given uh, one of the first converts that you see in Philippi, which was Lydia, right? It says in verse 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, she was a seller of purple. Okay. Now, back then, you know, getting these garments, these, you know, clothing, tapestry, that type of thing, textiles, that was hard to come by. You couldn't just, you know, run down to Joanne Fabrics and pick up whatever you like. You know, you had to get, uh, it was a, a very unique craft. It was something that was very, you know, uh, expensive, especially when you're getting into dyes and things like that. That's why she's a seller of purple, right? So that could kind of show us the fact that this is a wealthy city, you know, given the fact that, one, there's a merchant there named Lydia who's selling this expensive type of thing. And we understand, the, you know, the, the, the law of supply and demand. You can't, spell, you can't sell expensive things if there's no one there to buy it, right? So we can kind of get a, start to get a feel what this city Philippi was kind of like. You know, it seems like it was a very prosperous city, that they had a lot of financial uh, prosperity. They had money so on and so forth. But let's talk a little bit more Lydia, about Lydia. It says she was a city of uh, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira. So again, she's somebody that was not native to that city, again, showing us that Philippi was a region where a lot of people came to. And again, that would increase, you know, the, the commerce that would take place. Uh, it says she, which worshiped God, uh, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she intended on the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide here. And she constrained us. So we see her salvation here. This is one of the very first converts. Uh, it's the first one that we see. And what we see from this also is that Lydia's house became a base of operations. Right? That She says there at the end, uh, she said when she was baptized, uh, it goes on and says, If ye count me faithful, come into my house and abide there. And then if the next verse, or verse 16 rather, it says, and it came to pass. So as, you know, he goes, Paul goes in there, Timotheus, Silas, they're there. And then it seems like 
that becomes kind of a, a base of operations. That's where the church begins to meet initially. Again, showing us that Lydia had some wealth. You know, this is, a, I mean, back probably a lot of people were getting saved. A lot of people were coming to the church and they're meeting in her house, right? Which means she has to have a, a substantial sized home to be able to have all these people there. Again, that requires money. But it says in verse 16, and it came to pass as we went to prayer. So what they're, they're leaving from, from Lydia's place now. This has become kind of a base of operations. And that's where, of course, verse 16, where we see the second convert that is mentioned in the city of Philippi. And this would be, as I've uh, coined her, the, de the demonic damsel, right? Because that's what she is, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, right? Verse 16, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much uh, gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show, uh, show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. So this is, you know, she's, she's become a nuisance. You know, she's, she's, she's butting in. Paul's trying to preach the word. She's following him around many days. And it says there again in verse 18, she this many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said, and, and said to the spirit, now speaking to the demonic spirit that was within her, I command thee come out in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And what I want to point out real quick is Paul's impartiality here when it came to his converts. You know, he was not somebody that was just, uh, he, he cared about preaching the gospel to whoever. You know, he wanted to get it to everybody. Uh, he was not partial in himself. He wasn't preferring somebody else above another. You would say, well, of course he went and preached to Lydia. I mean, look, everything she had to offer. She had the house. She had the purple. She had, you know, she could put the check in the offering plate. She could fill the place up. You know, it was nice. And what Paul's showing us here is that he cared just as much for Lydia as he did for this, this, uh, this damsel that was actually being exploited. And you think it's the complete opposite of Lydia's situation. She's very wealthy, she's uh, successful in her business, she's making money. Then on the other opposite end of the spectrum, you have this young girl who's being exploited by these masters and she's probably you know, be being given just enough to sustain her. You know, she brought her masters much gain by suicide. He doesn't say she brought it to herself. And what that shows us again is that Paul is impartial about who joined the church. And this is something that we have to keep in mind as well is that we don't want to, uh, you know, start to judge people or say, you know, we're a church that's only for the middle class or we're a church that's only for the upper class or we only want, you know, the poor to come here. No, we want people from all economic, uh, 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 the whole spectrum to be able to come here. No matter what their economic standing is, they should be welcome in the house of God. You didn't see that with Paul say, oh, Lydia, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were so wealthy. You know, I'm glad you're saved, but... No, let's have church in your house. <laughs> uh, you know, this demonic girl, well, I'd preach her the gospel, but what she got to offer? That's not Paul's approach. And that's something we have to keep in mind. Now, I think the tendency uh, with, with uh, what I've seen, you know, in our stripe or our brand of, of Baptist churches is that we don't look so much down on the poor. You know, the poor, we're like, yeah, we want the poor, because that's probably most of us, right? We would say, you know, by the American standard of living, you know, by the way, we're not living on dirt floors and chasing our next meal, as in so many other parts of the world, right? But, you know, we would say, oh, the poor, come in, come in, you know. But maybe it might be that we, when, when, the, when the wealthier person comes in, you know, when they come rolling in with a nice vehicle and they have everything, and maybe you'd say, oh, well, you might get a little bit of a stuck-up attitude or just say, well, they just don't understand the plight of the common man, you know, or, or whatever it might be. And, I, you know, I, hopefully that isn't the case, but it, it very well may be, and it shouldn't be. And Paul addresses that, or excuse me, James, rather. You don't have to turn there. In James 1, it says in verse 9, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, right? The brother of low degree should rejoice in that he is exalted. You know, he goes into church, and everyone's on the same plane, Right? That's why he's exalted, because he's brought up to the foot of the cross, where there is no Jew nor Greek, you know, there's no, there's no rich or poor, there's no bond or skinthian, you know, none of these things. It's all level 
uh, it's all a level playing field at the cross. So the brother of low degree, whom society would look at, you know, kind of like this, uh, the demonic damsel and try to exploit whatever, oppress. Uh, when they come into the house of God, they're exalted. As a child, they become a child of God. They are an heir to, uh, they're, they're an heir of Christ, a joint heir. And it says, uh, but the rich and that he is made low. So the, 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 but, you know, the, the, the rich is supposed to rejoice and that he is made low. Now, notice it doesn't say the rich and that he isn't allowed. No, the rich is allowed. You know, we understand that there's a danger in riches, that money is the root of all evil. And we'll talk a little bit about that here at the end as well. But the rich are just as welcome, you know, and the rich can rejoice just as much as the brother of low degree. The rich can rejoice just as much in the poor because they also are brought low and brought to that same level field. And what is that level playing field? A child of God, you know, a, a born-again Christian. That's what we rejoice in, whether we're a brother of low degree or whether we are wealthy. So Paul was impartial. He was not, uh, did not have preference who joined the church. Rich or poor, didn't matter. He just wanted them saved, so on and so forth. And we should have that same attitude. You know, when we go out and knock on a door, we shouldn't go into the wealthier neighborhoods and say, oh, no one's going to get saved here. You know, and, and uh, we're fortunate here in Tucson because it's kind of a, it's a clean slate, right? The map is very, hasn't been filled in very much. So we have a lot of the poorer communities to go to, which is where we're going to go. You know, that is the, prime, that is the emphasis that, that, we, uh, that, that Christ gave when it came to going out and preaching the gospel. Go to the poor, right? But that doesn't mean we should get a bad attitude towards the wealthy. You know, and, and I've been leading a soul winning time up in Tempe on Wednesday nights for two years, and we go to the wealthy neighborhoods because everything else has been done sometimes several times over. And we go into these neighborhoods, and, you know, I, even myself, and I've noticed it in others, they have, you need to check your heart sometimes when you go into these because people can kind of get this downtrodden attitude, oh, here we go again, you know. Uh, I, their, their front lawn is bigger than my whole house, and it's such a wealthy neighbor. No one's going to get saved here. Well, what's funny about that is about every week somebody gets saved, even in these wealthier neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, Paul, you know, that, that's the attitude that he wants us to have, that whether we're going to a poor neighborhood, whether we're going into a rich neighborhood, you know, we should preach the gospel and trust the Lord to, to work in the hearts of the people that we preach to. And... Uh, you know, here's the thing, too, and I'll just say this, is that, you know, people get discouraged when you go into these neighborhoods and you go into these wealthy neighborhoods and, and they feel like they're failing because they didn't get somebody saved or, you know, only one person got saved out of, you know, seven teams, 15 people, whatever that were out there. But whether you're a rich neighborhood, poor neighborhood, if, is getting people saved, is that the command? No, that's the, that's the result of obeying the command is that people get saved, right? The command is to go and preach. So if you go and preach, you know, you're already a success. You've already obeyed the Great Commission. And whether it's receptive or not, you know, that alone should put a smile on your face. That you're doing something that a lot of people don't bother to do. That a lot of Baptist churches are, are letting just go by the wayside today. To go out and just obey the command to go at all. So I always remind myself of that. And I say, I repeat that line a lot to people who I sense are getting, you know, they might make a remark of, you know, oh, here we go again. It's like, hey, we didn't get anyone saved, but did you go? Well, then you, then you obeyed. But again, Paul here, he's, let's get back into it. Paul was impartial about who joined the church, you know, and that's the attitude we have. But you have to understand that if you want converts, it's going to cost you something, right? It's not just going to come free. You know, that's the case with Paul. I'm not saying this is what's going to cost us, but it's a principle that we can apply. It says in verse 19, and when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, again, not hers, theirs, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. You know, they were going out soul winning and, you know, might say something like, and they called the police department. They got the, uh, you know, they, they got the, the building manager, right? They had, were persecuted. <clears throat> and he says they uh, trouble our city. And teach customs which are not lawful as for to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them to prison, uh, and charging the jailer to keep them safely, who receiving, uh, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And that's when Paul gave up. That's when he said, I'm just, I can't pay this price anymore. This is too much. No, they sang. 
right? We know how the story goes. It's a very, very uh, familiar story. They sang hymns, and at midnight, the, you know, the earthquake came, the cell doors opened, and so on and so forth. You know, Paul was able to do a lot of great works for God, wasn't he? But it came at a price. You know, Paul was able to see Lydia get saved. He was able to see this demoniac uh, girl get saved. He was able to see a lot of people get saved that we don't read about in the book of uh, uh, Philippians or in the book of Acts. But it came at a price. And look, it, it, our converts are going to cost us something. You know, it, it might not mean that you have to get cast into prison. You might not get beat for it. You know, but here's the thing. It's going to cost you your time. It's going to cost you the effort and the energy to learn how to give the gospel. It might cost you having to actually sit down and mark your Bible, memorize the scriptures, maybe even practice. It's going to cost you the time to go out and be a silent partner and learn how to do the work. It's going to cost you having to go out and be faithful to a soul winning time. If you want converts, if you want that, that's what it costs. It costs us something. Now, praise the Lord, it doesn't cost us this. <laughs> You know, but here's the thing, if this was the cost, you know, if it ever came to this, those of us that aren't willing to pay these minimal costs of all those things I just mentioned, we would never, we would never put up with that. That would be the end of us. We'd say, well, enough soul winning. I'm, you know, I, I, I schedule, you know, whatever time, you know, this minimum amount of time, just enough to say I go. You know, if this was the cost, we would fall away, Right. You know, our cost is pretty low when we compare it to Paul's. It's just costing us our time, you know, and, and, and we live in a place kind of like Philippi, very affluent, very wealthy, very, uh, you know, this country is, is very prosperous, you know, and we have a lot of freedom. Why aren't we taking advantage of it? Why aren't we going out and doing it if, if we're not? <clears throat> and of course, you know, it might cost you something, but even then, Paul's mentality, you know, willing to pay that price. He continues to even get more converts. We know the story. He doesn't throw up his hands and say, that's it, I quit. That's where the story of the Philippian jailer comes in, right? We all know that story, how he comes and he said, you know, he's ready to thrust himself through. And Paul says, do thyself no harm. And he comes in and falls down trembling and asks that question that we all recite at the door often. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gets saved. And they, of course, uh, you know, baptize him in his house and then he feeds them. So it all worked out. Look, if you're willing to pay the price, you will get the converts. It will happen. But you got to be willing to put in the effort and whatever it takes, uh, whatever's necessary to make it happen. And praise God, it's not costing us as much as it is costing Paul, although maybe someday it will. <clears throat> so we've looked at a few things here about uh, Philippi, about the people there. We've looked at the converts. The other thing I would like to look at and we'll kind of tie this all together at the end, is the leadership. I think this is an important principle that we could see here, the leadership that's in Philippi. Now, uh, you have to remember the way Acts kind of reads when it comes to the character of Luke. There's this they and we, they and we. Paul, or excuse me, Luke rather, is of course the one who's penning the book of Acts, okay? And it says there, if you're still in Acts chapter 16, look at verse 4, and as they, referring to Paul, Timotheus, and Silas, as they went through the cities, they delivered uh, them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. Verse 6, now when they had gone through throughout uh, Phrygia, Phrygia and the regions of Galatia, and verse 7, and after they were come. So you see this they, verse 8 again, they, he's, he's telling everything that happened to them, right? Because he's not with them yet, right? So where does he come into the story here? Well, it says in verse 8, and they passing by Messiah came down to Troas. Okay, that's where they come. And then look, notice after, in verse 10, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we, so you see, this is where Luke is joining him in the story, I believe. When he comes to Troas, which is near to Philippi, now the, 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 the narrative begins to read, we, not they. And this is important. I'll, and there's a point here, so stick with me. And it says here, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, surely gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them, Therefore, loosing from Troas, we, uh, uh, we, uh, we came straight with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi. So this is how they ended up in Philippi, and this is where I believe Luke stays for, you know, I've heard people say he was there for about 20 years until he saw Paul again, which is significant, okay? Notice there it says in, uh, in, towards the end of verse 12, and we were in that city abiding certain days. 
Now, verse 40, it says, and they went out of prison, right? This is after the Philippian jailer, and entered the house of Lydia. So where do they go? They go to the house of Lydia. Why do they go there? And when they had seen the brethren, again, showing us that the church is meeting in Lydia's house. That's where the brethren were. They said, well, we got to let people know that we're out. We got to let the church know that we're we're free. Tell them this cool story, what happened with this jailer and this earthquake and everything, right? I mean, if you that happened to you, you'd want to probably go tell the brethren, right? Because we'd be the only ones that believe you. No, everybody else would, would, would wonder about it. You'd say, oh, okay. Huh? And they pat you on the head. So they're running over. But the, notice, again, they're going to the house of Lydia. Again, further evidence. That's where the church was at that time. And they comforted them and departed. Chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through. So you see how it changes there? It goes, we, we. It goes, they, 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 they. We, Troas, Philippi, they depart, they. Which shows us that Luke stayed behind. That's what I believe, is that Luke, at this point in the story, stays behind. Now, why did Luke stay behind? You know, some people say that he was, maybe he lived there. There's other things, but I just want to see what's actually in the Scripture. And I, I think what the Scripture is showing us is that, uh, you know, that he was left behind to establish leadership, okay? Because people say, oh, see, Linnea, house church, right? And there's a big house church movement taking place today. And I'm not opposed to churches in a house, Right, that churches start out that way. That's there's nothing wrong with that. That's how it's starting out in the book of Acts. It's a biblical way of doing things. But today there's this philosophy and this mentality of, well, since we're meeting in a house, or or people are rather, I should say, they are meeting in a house because they don't want to have leadership. They're saying, though, well, you know, everyone's a pastor. Anyone can be the deacon. Anyone can stand up and preach. And it's just a free-for-all. Now that's not I'm not, I'm not saying that's the case all the time. But there, that is out there. And really, that warrants a whole sermon. This is just something I'd throw in there because it's, it's worth pointing out. Luke rejoins Paul, you know, some 20 years later. But notice, that's, you know, Philippi is written, is a, is a epistle that was written while he was in jail. In fact, people say it's the last epistle, a uh, prison epistle that he wrote before he was released by the Romans. It's written from Rome. So if you see the big picture, you have Paul going on his missionary journey, ending up in Philippi with Luke, leaving Luke in Philippi and in the church that's in Lydia's house, and then 20 years later, another mission jury meets him again, then sometime later, writing to him, and how does he address them when he's writing to the same church that was at that time meeting in Lydia's house, whether they ever got a building or moved on to whatever, we don't know. But even if they were there, even if they were still in Lydia's house, how does he, what is, again, we read it, Philippians 1.1. 1, 1, to who was it written? The bishops and the deacons. Which shows us that Luke was left behind to establish leadership. He was there to put people into these positions and to ordain elders in the city. <clears throat> and I point that out today because, again, I'm not against a church in a house. You know, I'm not against that, but I am against churches that don't want to have any leadership. I don't think it's biblical. And today we have a lot of these house churches that they're establishing their some, themselves simply because they have an aversion to authority. You know, they don't want anyone to be in the lead. But you got to have somebody in the lead. Somebody's got to lead the thing. Someone's got to take it in a direction, you know, and that's just uh, how God has set up the local church. The last thing I want to look at, I'm almost done is we've looked at several things about the place and the people of, Phil of Philippi today. We've looked at some of the first converts. We've looked at uh, their, their geographic location, the fact that they benefited from that. And I think we see the fact that they were benefiting from it because of the Church of Philippi's, uh, Philippi's liberality, right? And, of course, we don't, today it means a different thing, but it means being very generous. You know, I guess we call them liberals today because they're very generous with other people's money, right? But... <laughs> Their, the liberality in the Bible means being charitable, giving, you know, having an open hand, okay? And this is something that, that, that uh, the Philippian church is just praised for, and they were known for, okay? And I believe that's because the fact that the citizens of Philippi were prospering financially, and they put that to good use. You know, again, I talked a little bit about how we shouldn't, you know, be biased towards people that might have wealth. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, unless it's gotten by vanity, you know, then it'll be soon, it'll be diminished. But if they've, through labor and hard work, you know, and, and honest work have, have, have prospered themselves, that's a good thing. You know, they've been successful by honest means. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Now, the important thing about it is if we are financially successful, to remember what we should be doing with those finances. Why is God blessing us? Why is God allow that to happen and give us that wisdom? If we are wealthy, like the people in Philippi were, we should put that wealth to good use. We should put that wealth to good use. Now, go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to have you turn to a couple places right here at the end. It says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 14, notwithstanding, withstanding, ye have done uh, well done, so he's praising them for this, that ye did communicate with, uh, with, with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also, verse 15, chapter 4, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. So when he got beaten and left, Macedonia left the church of Philippi and left Luke there, no church communicated with me. And communication the Bible is talking about money about helping him financially, supporting him. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. He's saying, look, you're the guys, you're the only ones that did it. For in Thessalonica, ye sent once again unto my necessity. Right? And again, Paul's not looking to get rich, but Paul's got to eat. And Paul has needs. Paul's got to put some clothes on his back. You know, and, and that's, again, a whole other doctrine. You know, there's nothing wrong. The, the laborer is worthy of his reward. You know, the, 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 you know, don't muzzle the, the, the ox that treadeth out the corn. And that's, you know, that's Paul. He's that ox, right? He's that laborer. He should be the first partaker of the fruits. You know, he's planted this vineyard. Nothing wrong with that. And again, that's something else you find in these house churches. You know, one of the major doctrines, if they don't want any leadership and they don't want to tithe, they just think it's all wrong, right? And, it, and they're the ones that are wrong. Okay, and Paul here is praising him, saying, you know, you sent once again out of my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that it may abound to your account. Right? And this is a good lesson for us. If we have wealth, if we give to the church, if we give to the missions, if we give to the, the, the promulgating of the gospel, that's fruit to our account. Now, that's not a substitute for us doing our own personal evangelism. But, you know, when we're, when we're giving to the, to the work of the Lord, you know, God sees that. And he says, and he chalks that up. That's re, that, I believe that. That's a reward. That, that, is that uh, what Paul just said? Paul said, I didn't desire this gift. Uh, I didn't desire it for myself. I desired that fruit may abound to your account. He said, look, I took what you gave me, and I went to this city and this city and this city, and I did the same thing there that I did in Philippi, and souls are getting saved. That's the fruit that abounds not only to Paul, but also to those that supported him and sent him there and made it possible for even, him to even do the work that he was able to do. Now, Paul is going to get it done one way or another. You know, he's a tent maker, and he would labor night and day. We understand that. But I imagine he was able to do even more than he otherwise would because of the people at the church of Philippi who understood that, they have, that though they have prospered, it matters what they do with their wealth. It matters what they do. And they sent it on ahead. You know, they laid their treasures up in heaven. And as we get into the book of Philippi, that really is a major theme in the book of Philippians. Not minding earthly things, but having a spiritual mind, seeing that which is to come, sending it forward, you know, setting our affections on things which are above. And you can see that here. What's one way, you know, people say, oh, I, you know, I, I'm setting my affection on things above. Okay, well, how does that manifest itself? Well, one way is through giving. You know, people have an abundance. They give to the work of the Lord, and it gets done. If you would, go to 1 Timothy 6. I'll wrap it up real quick here for sake of time. But, you know, it, it, again, Paul even mentions in 2 Corinthians 8, he brings up the Philippian church again. He says, uh, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, of, we, he's saying we would want you to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that a great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded on the riches of their liberality. For their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing to, uh, of themselves uh, and he goes on and just, again, he's referring to the Church of Macedonia, and, he says, and he's even reminding the Corinthian people, look, the Philippians are the ones that gave to me. The Philippians are, are this giving church. They're generous. They're even willing to give of themselves. Again, showing us that the, the, this is why we're taking the time to go through Acts 16, because we kind of get a sense of what the people in Philippi were like. Because remember, the book of Philippians, Paul really loves on these people. You go read Philippians 4.1, where it's like, dearly beloved and, and loved in the Lord. It's just love, 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 love all through it. And it's, a, and it's a very nice book to read through. He's very, he's praising them. It's, it's a lot about, a lot, the, the, the theme is joy. It's, it's a great book. But we got to get it. Why is that? We'll get a sense of the type of people that were there. Very generous people. 
people who weren't biased, people who were willing to open up their homes, people who were willing to give even of themselves. <clears throat> and what the Philippian people should remind us of is the fact that we as God's people need to invest in the gospel. Invest in the gospel. If you look there in 1 Timothy 6, it says in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great grain, for we brought nothing into this world and a certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, and again, that's will be rich, not they that are rich. It's people that, that their only goal in life is to be rich. They that will be rich. They say, I don't have time for the soul winning. I don't have time for the things of God. I got to focus on making money, right? And that is, you know, something that's promoted in our culture. That is something that the world says, Make money, make money, make money, make money. And people just give their whole lives to just making money, don't they? And Paul gives a warning here in verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. You know, you're not going to see that on the, you know, that's not what they're putting on the Wild Horse Pass Casino bulletin boards. Come get destruction and perdition. You know, try to make it strike it rich. That's not, a, there's no scratch off that says that. Destruction and perdition, you know. But that's what people want. They want all that money. And Paul says, if that's what you want, you better be careful because it will drown you in these things. And why is that? Because there's some sins that you can't get involved in without a lot of money. Or you have to have a constant flow of money to keep that sin going, right? Some sins, or, 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 or even if it's a sin that any, any poor person can get involved in, you know, it's magnified. It goes, it's taken to another level. There's, it's, it's just indulged in even more because of the wealth that people, you know, come into. <clears throat> he says here in verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself, it's the love of it. That's the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Jump to verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. In verse 18, you know, this is a commandment that Paul is giving to the wealthy and the Philippian people. I feel, I feel like they, they nailed it. They knocked it out of the park. It says they do, they, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. They, they did all those things. And people might tend, you know, the penny pinchers and the bean counters might say, well, what do they need our money for? What do they want that for? They just want our money to do this or do that. Well, look at what Paul says, though, at the end. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. He's saying, remind the rich to be willing to distribute and give and invest in the gospel, not just for the sake of the gospel, but for themselves. You know, they're not going to take it any You can't take it with you. The only way you can invest it in heaven is by investing in the gospel. That's how you lay up in store a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And the wealthy might struggle with this if they don't do that last little bit there. Lay hold on eternal life. It's something he's told Timothy to do before. He said, Timothy, you got to lay hold on eternal life. What, now, is he saying, buy your way into heaven? No, he's saying, you're saved. We know that's not the case, right? We, we all understand the gospel here. He's saying, lay hold on eternal life. Wrap your mind around heavenly things. Lay hold on the fact that you're born again, that you're saved, that you're on your way to heaven. And you know what? This money, it, it's not going to matter as much to you. The things of earth, as the, as the song says, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So if we lay hold on eternal life, you know what? It, the, the, it's easier to give. It's easier to open up the hand and give. And you say, well, I don't have a lot of wealth. Uh, you know, how does that apply to me? How do I invest in the gospel? I don't, I'm not these Philippians. I don't have, I'm not a seller of purple. <laughs> you know? I, don't, I don't have any of that. Well, again, I'll remind us the most valuable thing, the most precious thing that any of us have, and it's something that we all have, is our time, is our time. You only get so much of that. And you can't, you can't earn more of that, you know. You might be able to extend your life, you know, by, by taking care of yourself. But, you know, even then, four score and ten, that's all you get. The most precious thing you have is not money. It's your time. So you might not have the great wealth, but you can still invest. You can still, you know, uh, uh, um, emulate, you know, the Philippian people. 
by giving of your time. That's how you're going to invest in the gospel. So I thought it'd be good to take the time tonight and just look at the, the, the people and the place of Philippi before we really start to dig into this book so we can get a sense of what these people were like and why Paul is just loving on them so much in this book is because they really are an exemplary church of, of people that put people first and the things of God first and not themselves and their own interests. Let's go ahead and pray.